Good evening, everybody. This is Thomas Ott from NeuralMarketTrends.com, and welcome to my video tutorial number 10 on RapidMiner 5.0. I spent a good few hours uh, before recording it originally and realized that when I uploaded it, I made a mistake in my experiment. So in order to prevent you guys from coming and yelling at me, I decided to scrap it and re-record it again. But in the meantime, I'm going to celebrate because I am now closing out my 10th video and I will be taking a well-deserved break. And I wanted to say thank you to all my readers and fans out there who kept making nice comments and asking good questions and becoming my friend. I really appreciate it. So I poured a beer for you and I'm going to toast to you. Thanks for coming along on the journey. Hmm. Good. So let's start this process all over again. We're going to pick up where we left off on video number nine. In video number nine, we had created an experiment that would read in the Excel data of the S&P 500, its time series starting from, uh, I think, April 2006, Ooh, all the way, I think, through March 17th or so of this year. Set roll operator, where we set the date to... Uh, an ID, the windowing operator, and a validating operator. And in this case, and tonight, we're going to fool around with an SVM, a support vector machine, instead of a standard neural net. But all this tend to, looks the same from previously before. Uh, but what I want to do tonight, what I want to do tonight is I want to take a step back and I want to talk a little bit about the window operator. Let's get, delete this. Let's delete this guy here. Delete the validation and delete him. And let's delete all these guys. What the heck here? Because I want to, because I had a couple of comments and some emails from people wondering about the windowing operator and maybe I didn't do a good enough um, a chat about it, a good enough explanation about it. But essentially, the windowing operator is not really a glorified um, lag operator. Um, it, it allows you to use multivariate data to build. Um, a time series model uh, which you could forecast out one day, two days, three days, etc. And that is done over here when we select the windowing operator, the horizon here. Right now, the way we have it set up that it's going to take all the data from the Excel, it's going to encode it by examples, example rows, it's going to use a window size of one which means it's going to take it on a daily basis, it's going to load the data in on a daily row, and step up, it's going to continue building the model by moving down one row at a time. But the horizon is what we want to predict. We want to predict one day in advance the closing price of the S&P 500. So what it does is, and I'm going to show you here, as I show you the example here, is um, it's going to take this data in the Excel and it's going to process it and output it under the example node here, which we're going to show. But I'm also going to show you what the original looks like so you get an idea on what it's doing. It's going to step the closing data, which is uh, T plus 1, and put it on the line for T, for time. Time is T is time. So let's run this real quick here. Okay. Here is the original example set, and I want you to pay attention here. It says 992 examples, one special attribute, and five regular attributes. And here you have the special attribute is the date, which we set as an ID. And we have 992 example rows of time series data for the S&P 500. We see here open, high, low, close, volume. Nothing new and spectacular. We all know that. Now, the windowing operator, what it's going to do is it's going to take, since it's since we're trying to forecast one day in advance, it's going to take the close on April 11th, which is 1288.12, .12, and it's going to create, it's going to start from here, and it's going to go all the way down to the next 991 example rows. And it's going to take that data, it's going to create a label from that, it's going to call it close, and it's going to shift it over it's going to it's going to take t plus 1 the close t plus 1 and shift it over starting at t equals 0 and then it's going to say okay it's going to rename these attributes to open dash 0 
high dash zero, low dash zero, close dash zero, and volume dash zero. The reason why this windowing operator does that is to avoid confusion, especially when you do the prediction later on the outer sample data. It purposely builds the model with through the windowing operator with two special attributes, one being this close as the label, the other attribute being special attribute being the date, which is ID, and five new regular five regular attributes that have been renamed. Okay, now let's go take a look at the example window set to show you what I mean. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Row one, April 10th, you have your time series data here. It's all the same from previously, except now the header rows have been renamed. And the label is 1288.2, which is the same as here. And you can see the label here, 1289.12, .12, is the same here, and so on and so forth. And that's what the windowing operator does. You can argue it's a lag operator. It does have a lagging feature to it to help you with the horizon, but it takes the data, transforms it, and gets it ready to be fed into your model, all with the easy dragging into the RapidMiner 5.0 GUI interface. Okay, let's go back and let's rebuild the model that you saw before here. We're going to disconnect the ports for the original one. We are going to get our sliding window validator here. Oops, uh, wrong bad. Let's see here. Got to start. Got to start drinking beer. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to connect the uh, performance and the training output. And we're not going to use a standard neural net. We're going to fool around with something called a support vector machine. I have used support vector machines for Forex training uh, and building models in Forex. Uh, sometimes they work pretty good. Um, they do tend to work pretty good with pattern recognition, especially if you use a dot kernel. Um, let's see here, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to apply model, apply model. Uh, forgive me if I'm going a little bit fast here. We, if you've been following me since the first video tutorials, um, you should be almost an expert by now. And you should have no problems with the GUI interface. Let's go do this, connect. We're going to set the performance operator has to be set to horizon one, okay, for the protection pr prediction trend accuracy. And we're going to go up here. We're going to set the validator. We're going to say, all right, I guess it's what, 20, training step size five, I don't know, 20. Let's do this five. Um, okay, we'll leave that there. All right, we're not going to do cumulative training for now. So let's run this real quick. Let's see how long this takes. I believe it should take a few seconds. There we go. Okay, uh, it took about two seconds, and we have a prediction trend accuracy of 46%. Not overly great. You can see here the windowing set did its job, as we've seen before. Um, let's try to take some out-of-sample data now and test against it, even though this is not a great model, but we're doing this for an example. Okay. Now, the trick is, is, and this is where I went wrong in my uh, previous video that I recorded for tonight, is that I put a model writer in the wrong location. I originally, in, in the old days of RapidMiner uh, 4.x in Yale, we typically encapsulated the model writer um, over here. But that's not necessarily the case because the validation uh, and the sub-processes under validation occur is an iterative process. So the data gets fed in, it gets split, um, then it goes ahead and it learns, it tests, it learns, it tests, it keeps adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. And if you try to write the model here, the model is going to keep getting overwritten, 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 and you don't know what is the best model that has been written. So the way to write the best model from this validation process is to use the model node here. Now what you can do is you can write model. Okay. You can do this. And I think we're going to try this because I want to show you the multiple ways of doing it. And you have to set the model writer here. Let's call it, uh, we're going to call it test mod. Okay. So now it's going to, as the, once the validation process is over, it's going to output the best model based on the performance. Okay. So here we go. So we do that. All right. Now, 
this builds a training model. Now we're going to take the out of sample data and take this model that we're going to write, we're going to load it in, and then we are going to test against it. And after we've done that, I'll show you a shortcut which you can cut this out. So let's go get, let's, we're going to copy the read Excel operator. And we are going to get our training data. I'm sorry, uh, not training, our out of sample data. We're going to get the select role again. Oops. Oh no, undo. Okay, here. Copy. And paste. Okay, so once again, we're going to set the date as the ID. And now what we're going to do is we're going to copy the windowing operator. And you're going to be wondering, why the heck are we doing that? Well, do you remember where I showed you that the windowing operator renames the five attributes from, you know, open to open dash zero and close to close dash zero? Well, we're going to have to do that again in order to avoid problems with the model here. Because if your model, your model is going to be trained on the following attributes, date, which is ID, your label, which is this close that the windowing operator created, and those five regular attributes, which are your input variables, which are open dash zero, high dash zero, low dash zero, close dash zero, and volume dash zero. If you don't take this sample data, this, this out of sample data here, which hopefully we'll show here, uh, as you can see here by this screen here, it is, it is listed as date, open, high, low, close, and volume. There's no dash zeros behind it. And that may cause problems when you load the model in. You may get errors or it may crash. So what we're going to do is we're going to pre-process the out-of-sample data to make it in the same format that the model is expecting. Okay. But we're going to change the parameters. Most importantly, we are going to not create the label. So we're going to click that off. And most importantly, we're going to say this is zero. We are not doing a horizon because we're not forecasting the data that we're going to, the model that we're going to apply to this data is going to forecast for us. Okay? So now, the next step, let's go drag this down a little bit, give some room, is since we're writing the model, what we could do is we could, we would then read the model back in. We have another read model operator. And we're going to apply the model. Oops. Apply model. Okay, so now we're going to connect, we're going to read the model, which is this test model here. Going to connect it to the model node. And the example, which is the windowing, which is the output here, output node is going to go to the unlabeled node on the apply model. And the label node is going to go out to the results. Okay, let's just check. I think we're ready to go. Let's run it. So we're going to take, we're going to train the model on S&P 500 time series data forecasting one day ahead from April 2006 to, I believe it was March 17, 2010. We're going to take out of sample data from March 18, 2010 to March 28th and test against it and see how accurately we are. Okay. Remember, we're only doing 46%. Our, our model is only 46% accurate. So we'll see how good this runs. Okay, voila, we're done. Once again, training windowing data. You've seen this before. This is all the same. Performance vector, 46.4%. Not good, but we'll work with it. Now, here's our windowing and the label. Ah, look at here. What do we have here? Pretty good looking, huh? So here we have... The, the windowed attributes into open dash zero, high dash zero, etc., which are then tested against the model that we applied. And here the model create the predictions, it, the prediction label. And as you can see here, there's some numbers 1161, 1164, 1172, etc. Now is the time for me to tell you that, um, when you are forecast, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to forecast prices, um, in, in, in financial time series for, um, asset classes because you're never going to get, you will never, it's impossible to get an exact number. 
But what you can do, and has been successful, is determining the direction. For instance here, on March 18th, with these inputs, it is predicting that the stock market or the S&P 500 will close 1161 the next day, which is higher than the 1159. So the direction is important here. It's going to close higher. And what happens? It did close higher. Now, 1161 and 1165 are off, but the direction is correct. Now, using this data from March 21st, it's saying that it's going to close down okay, from today's close. And as you can see here on the next day, that was wrong. It actually closed up. So then it took this data again, loaded it in, and predicted saying that it's going to close down two points. And lo and behold, it did close down, but not at 1172, but rather at 1167. Now, taking this data again, it predicts saying it's going to close down a little bit more. And sure enough, that was correct. Now, taking this data, it's going to say it's going to close up. And sure enough, it was correct. It closed up. Likewise, it says it's going to close up again. And it did. So in this case, the direction was fairly accurate. The direction of the closing trend was, well, not trend, the closing prices was accurate. But the actual value was not. So in financial time series forecasting, you could mimic patterns and determine the waves fairly well, the direction of which where things are going to go fairly well, but you can never ever get an exact closing number. So if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to get it. And, and this is what probably frustrates a lot of people thinking when they're playing with neural nets and uh, trying to devise the magic formula to make all these stock predictions. You're never going to get the right value, but you can do um, direction. And this, and here's a secret, this is particularly very handy for volatility analysis. Volatility being a very sticky subject, pardon that pun, um, tends to do very well in forecasting the direction. Um, I have in my past written a model that has roughly 67% accuracy in determining the direction of option volatility, the horse, horse, sorry, historical volatility. Uh, which then you could then use to do option trading, which I did in the past for a little bit here and fooled around with. Um, nothing spectacular to write home about as far as my results, but it was just fooling around. So anyway, there you have it. This is this concludes my 10th video on Rapid Miner 5.0. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, oh, before I close out, I wanted to show you a little trick. You don't need this. You don't need the read model, and you don't need the write model. You can just take this connection and apply it to here and run it again and you should get the same darn thing same darn thing folks nothing right home okay now I can close out while I take a sip of my beer here thanks again everybody for watching my video tutorials I really appreciate it and I enjoyed the journey um, I met so many great friends over um, gtalk and through comments and emails i'm glad i could help you i'm glad i can get you started on rapid miner which is one of the most fantastic open source data discovery tools out there i have to once again give props and thanks to the rapid miner development team for creating the new gui system it is fantastic you have made my productivity in fooling around with this stuff a lot better and made it made it possible for me to go ahead and to share this with other interested people. Um, I will be taking an extended break here. I'm going to probably spend more time at my forums uh, building those up. So I I hope you join and register on my forums and join the party and post your questions and your ideas and and we can troubleshoot things. It's it's a it's an idea lab of sorts in which we can all learn using Rapid Miner to our various financial successes, I hope. This is Thomas Ott for NeuralMarketTrends.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. See you soon.